The horror game genre stands as one of the most densely saturated landscapes in video gaming, boasting a plethora of titles, delivering experiences to elicit fear, suspense, or even outright panic. Perhaps you've braved the grotesque horrors of Resident Evil, the fog-laden streets of Silent Hill, or the heart-pounding corridors of Outlast and Amnesia. Maybe you've even dared to navigate into the twisted mazes of indie titles like Slenderman or even Baldi's Basics. But amongst this cacophony of terror, there exists a little gem, often overlooked, and I'd wager that a significant portion of you have yet to experience its haunting embrace. In this video, if you haven't guessed, we're going to be playing Darkwood, a game developed by Acid Wizard Studio, described by its developers as an atmospheric survival horror with a new perspective. Explore the forest by day and hunker down in your hideout by night. Darkwood is a game that's been sitting in my Steam library for years, and now it's time to finally give it a shot. Throughout this review, we'll be critiquing every storyline, every mechanic, and the overall experience to answer the simple question, is it worth playing? During my time making this video, I played the game a lot. I played it multiple times with multiple characters, redoing some of the same content to progress new storylines, and every single time, the game remained as tense and atmospheric as it did on day one. Darkwood is a game about fear, but not in the conventional, scary horror game sense. You'll never be abused by cheap tricks or cheated with forced scares. It's more about the rustling of trees and the crunching of branches and foliage beneath your feet. That splash of rain on your cheek as the storm rolls in, which slowly fades into the awful screeching, banging, scraping, thumping, choking sounds you'll hear in the the distant forest. Darkwood isn't terrifying. It's atmospheric, claustrophobic, anxiety-inducing, nail-biting fear and suspense. And as the loading screen suggests, respect the woods, be patient and focus. When starting a new game, we're greeted with three difficulty options, normal, hard or nightmare. Normal is the bog standard way to play. Hard and nightmare mode add some spicy difficulty. In hard mode, you'll have limited lives with the ability to increase them in ways we'll look at later. And in nightmare mode, you'll only get one chance. And if you die, the game ends. I select normal mode because I'm a big wimp and the game begins. That was actually pretty disturbing, and after the cutscene ends, we're thrown into the prologue. Here, the game sets up the story and teaches us the basic mechanics. We awake in a dark room and get our bearings on the controls. Darkwood is a unique top-down horror game, which has its roots firmly in old Armour Games titles like The Last Stand, and very much reminds me of the old Flash games from the past, in a good way. One of the first things you'll likely notice is the line of sight mechanic, which is actually really well implemented. I feel like a guard straight out of Metal Gear Solid. The protagonist is unable to see anything outside of his field of vision, and the small radius around your character acts almost like peripheral hearing, enabling you to detect anything which comes in close range. So if you're not constantly looking around, things can easily sneak up on you, which really adds a whole layer to the immersive horror ambience. In a similar respect, there's also a fog of war mechanic akin to real-time strategy games. Anything you've not yet discovered won't be visible in the fog of war, and when you turn your back, it'll be shrouded until you look at it it again, almost like a simulation of the protagonist's memory. There's a few areas in the game where the line of sight and fog of war mechanics are combined really well, and we'll take a look at them as we go. Leaving the room, we're introduced to our house, and we get a message at the bottom of the screen. Messages are often given in a first-person context, and Darkwood is a game all about ambience and atmosphere, and being able to see the thoughts and feelings of our character really adds to that immersion. Our character recalls that the generator is almost out of fuel, so we'll need to find a gasoline can to refill it. We recall a broken tractor to the east, and so we have our first objective. For the time being, I decide to explore our house a little more, and we find a few more items of interest, including a camera, a medical bag, and a photo, so I'm guessing that we're a doctor. These items often carry some narrative or progression value, and having them separate from your actual inventory is a great way to streamline the gameplay. Given that Darkwood has a clear emphasis on inventory management, it's a relief to not have to constantly be burdened by otherwise useless story trinkets. I've got absolutely no idea what this photo is supposed to resemble. Maybe it's a ghost, maybe it's a half-cooked fried egg, who knows? Nearby, I also find a collection of oddly human-sized cages, and when we observe them, our character tells us that they're empty. This time. Wait, what do you mean this time? What the hell does this character do in his free time? We move into the adjacent room, and here on the floor we can see odd scratches. Make a note of these, because they'll be important later. 
Inside the cabinet, we find a key that we can use to unlock the front door. And good on you, game, for having an immersive in-game tutorial system that teaches us how to use items and objects. There's also a radio nearby which can be interacted with. When we look at it, our character tells us that he's been hearing voices through the static. Darkwood has a lot of references to radios and telephones, and it's a theme we'll be seeing a lot of across the game. In the hallway, I try and open the door, and when I do, our character tells us that he'd rather not open the door because of how long it took to get him in there. So obviously, there's someone inside. Is that what these cages are for? If you listen closely, you'll be able to hear some suspicious banging. That's not weird at all, and after finding out that our character is a literal psychopath, I leave in search of fuel. In the garden, we come across a dog, who looks like he's seen better days, honestly. As you walk past the poor creature, the game will make you feel bad, with noises like this. Our character suggests that maybe it would be best to end poor Fluffy's suffering, but you're left to make the choice for yourself. This small, insignificant choice is one of many we'll be making throughout our playthrough, and depending on the choice you decide on, you'll face the repercussions later. Exploring the world is an incredibly atmospheric experience due to the awesome sound design and general ambience. You'll always feel constantly on edge due to that field of vision, which will make you think that there's someone behind you, and when you turn around, there'll be nothing there. Well, most of the time. Out on the road, I find an axe on the floor, and we get another in-game hint teaching us how to swing it. Combat is something we'll see later on, but for now we learn to raise our axe with the right mouse button and swing down with the left, breaking the tree trunk in our path. As you'll notice, we have a stamina system shown just under our health bar in grey, and this is what we'll use to sprint around and swing weapons. We stumble upon a claustrophobic tunnel in between roots and trees, leaning into a small cave, and this is where the unsettling atmosphere starts to creep up. You'll start to hear whispers, which gradually intensify, and the background ambience complements this with melancholic, slow, calming music. Darkwood really has a knack for applying tension and peacefulness to an otherwise scary situation, and this juxtaposition really adds a sense of intrigue and atmosphere. Because the game is told from a top-down perspective, the camera really makes you feel exposed, and here we get our first jump scare. Just kidding. Darkwood doesn't really do jump scares and doesn't rely on cheap tricks to create horror. Instead, the game builds tension slowly and constantly through other means and it's really effective. I genuinely feel on edge while playing. Nearby, I find a dark cavern, which is too dark to explore. Fortunately, we find an extinguished campfire nearby and while looting it, we find some matches, rags and planks, which can be used to create a torch. Crafting is similar to other survival games you might already be familiar with, and when you open your inventory, you'll be presented with a nice, user-friendly crafting menu. The items you have the materials to craft for will be highlighted in colour, and anything you can't craft will be grey. Darkwood's crafting system is really robust, and I haven't found that many issues with it, except for a few annoyances that we'll talk about later. So far, I'm really enjoying this. The mechanics are taught in simple, easy-to-understand chunks, and the story is laid over the top. I really hope that this wonderful design continues further into the game, and spoilers, it does. Equipping our torch, we can now navigate through the dark woods, and you'll notice that in our inventory, the item starts to glow red. Items have a durability, and using an item like a torch or a flashlight will deplete it until it gives up and dies. Eventually, I encounter an abandoned house and a corpse tied to a tree. The game tells us that in a few days' time, the corpse will be absorbed by the forest. So far, we have absolutely no idea why this forest is seemingly consuming everything, but we'll find out later. And seriously, what the hell is this? Is it a tree? Is it a deer? Who knows? We find a clearing and a man curled over in a pool of what I assume to be his own blood. If you try to interact with him, you'll be able to loot him, but I don't know why we're trying to nick things from an unconscious man. If you hover over this man's key before stealing it, the game informs us that we might be able to use this key to unlock the exit to the woods. I'm not sure how you figured that out from just this key, but I'm not going to question it. We steal the man's key and then steal the man himself for good measure. We drug him and carry him back all the way to our house. What a nice and friendly person we are. By this point, I had absolutely no idea what was going on, but after torturing this poor fellow, we leave, and when we wake up, we take control of the previously kidnapped man. It's a bit early in the game for twists, but this was a really cool plot thread, and I was really intrigued to continue playing. Who are we? Where are we? What is happening in this forest and why? So many questions. So, our character is understandably pissed because the Doctor, or our previous character, nicked his key, so the general premise of the game is revealed. We need to steal back the key from the Doctor, or ourselves, in order to escape the woods, and my brain already hurts. While being busy stuck inside our cupboard prison, I find a locked container which we can't yet open. Fortunately, you'll find two wires nearby, and you can use them to craft a lockpick to open the container. Containers can be interacted with just like items. Holding down the right mouse button will open a context-sensitive menu, allowing us to use the lockpick to open the container. Inside, we find a flashlight and a shovel, which we can use to smash open the door. This is another nice immersive introduction to some basic mechanics, and from this, the game has taught us how to use and craft items, how to use weapons, and we can also use these weapons to break down barricades, all in a day's work. 
Unfortunately, breaking down barricades uses up a lot of weapon durability, so we're left defenseless. The house is a lot darker than when we first arrived, so our new flashlight is a welcome addition over the wooden torch from earlier. While exploring the house for a second time, you'll notice that a lot of the doctor's belongings have mysteriously disappeared, which leads me to believe that he's not coming back. This time when we tried to enter the room we heard noises from earlier, the door is locked with a code, so I'm assuming that there must be one around here somewhere. Interacting with this door triggers a voice to call out to us from inside, so there's definitely someone in there. So far I'm really enjoying how Darkwood naturally pushes the player towards progression. There's no direct quest log or any instructions of what you need to do, you're simply left to explore and figure things out on your own. Eventually I find a cabinet blocking the entrance to a secret room, and this is another simple puzzle designed to teach you the mechanics of the game. If you push or drag the cabinet out of the way, a secret door is revealed. Inside we find a table with some straps, and I would bet that this isn't being used for dentistry. We can also find a can of gasoline and a table leg to defend ourselves. It's not much, but it's better than nothing. Using the can of fuel, we pour it into the generator to provide electricity. And the act of pouring fuel into the generator kind of reminds me of Amnesia the Bunker. It takes a few seconds to pour the fuel, and while doing so, your character is locked into place. So I imagine this might get quite tense later on. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a bar which shows you how much fuel is left, which is really handy. Suddenly, we get interrupted by a man whose face has been replaced by dials. And seriously, I don't even want to imagine what that looks like. This is a great example of how Darkwood uses its narrative and storytelling to allow the player to conjure the scene in their own mind. The fact that this is entirely left up to our own imagination makes it even more disturbing. The man repeats four numbers, four, eight, nine, and two, and that sounds like a code. And sure enough, we can use it to unlock the nearby door. Inside, we're forced to fight as a prisoner attacks us, so we beat him to death with a table leg. Self-defense, I promise. On his corpse, we loot a strange, creepy plastic chicken, which might not mean much right now, but this will be an important item later on. I don't have much time to reflect on what just happened though, because as soon as we take the toy, the man begins chuckling and chatting nonsense. This next cutscene shows a man with peanuts for arms, at least I think it's a man, and I assumed he saved us, or at least dragged us off somewhere else, and with that, chapter 1 begins. We awaken alone in a house that's seen better days, and this is the beginning of the main section of the game. From here, we're pretty much left to fend for ourselves. Exploring our new surroundings, I find an oven, which according to our character is exuding a strangely pleasant aroma, described as the protective substance, and that's not ambiguously disgusting in the slightest. When inside the hideout, you'll get a buff shown in the top left, indicating that we're protected from the forest, but only when the oven is on. If you're caught out at night, anywhere except for inside the hideout with the oven turned on, you're gonna have a really, really bad day. You don't need to feed the oven anything to operate, so all we need to do is stay nearby. Which is fine, because I wasn't planning to wander off anyway. Through further dialogue, we learn that our current location is one of multiple hideouts. And from this, we can assume that we must have been separated from a larger group. And that probably means that there are also more hideouts nearby. When you interact with the oven, you'll get this menu, which shows an empty syringe. The oven is a core mechanic, and we'll get back to it later when we have something that we can put inside. In a nearby dresser, I find some useful supplies, and a photograph titled The Road Home. I'm assuming that this is a photograph of where we need to get to. Entering the main room of the hideout, our character remarks that the other windows have been barricaded, and tells us, himself, that we should consider finishing off the job if we're going to stay here, and that sounds like a pretty smart idea. You'll also notice the workbench, which we can use to craft more advanced items than you can by hand. The workbench has several potential upgrades as well, requiring more and more advanced resources to complete, and each upgrade level allows you to craft better and better recipes. The workbench can also be used to upgrade items, increasing their durability or damage, or you can repair items here if they're broken. You can also find fabric, which is usually rewarded for completing quests from other characters, and this can be used to upgrade your hotbar or inventory capacity, allowing you to hold more items, which is really useful. 
The workbench also has a large storage container, which enables the player to store all of their items and do crafting from one single location. Although this took me longer than I would like to admit to figure this out, and I ended up at the start storing all of my items in random containers strewn about, and this became a problem for crafting, so when I eventually figured out that the workbench could store items, I felt a bit stupid. Darkwood is a game with its core features heavily ingrained into crafting and survival mechanics, and unlike some bad survival games you might have played in the past, Darkwood constantly keeps these mechanics important and relevant. It's not just an afterthought tacked onto the side, you'll need to engage heavily with the crafting systems if you want to finish the game, which is great. In my opinion, Darkwood could have stood alone without any crafting systems and it would still have been an exceptional horror game, and I'll go into this further with some specific examples later on. But wait, what the hell is that bubbling sound? In the hallway near the front door, you'll notice weird pulsating mushrooms. If you stand on them, you'll get a poison debuff, which causes your health to drain away. But more importantly, you can also harvest these for an item. Picking mushrooms adds them to our inventory, and these can be cooked in the oven to increase the syringe meter. But you'll need to be quick because they'll rot away, turning into a completely useless item if you don't use them in time. Outside the house, we also find a saw, which, as the game explains, is used to chop wood into planks, costing fuel in the process. So you'll need to split your gas reserves between the generator to keep the lights on at night and the saw for planks to craft items like weapons and barricades. There's also this locked chest with a code, which I never managed to open. After finishing the game, I looked it up, and it turns out that the code for this chest was given to early supporters of the game, and nowhere in-game will you ever find the code to open this. So, I guess we'll never know what's inside. With the basics out of the way and some exploring under our belt, it begins to get dark for the first time, and I prepare for our first night alone. The hideout is pretty beat up, and it doesn't have much in the way of defences, with some walls having huge gaping holes leading right out into the forest. Out of desperation, I move a cabinet to the hole to block it, but I doubt this is going to stop anything from getting inside. I really like the fact that you can use furniture and objects to craft makeshift barricades, and even though it's unlikely to save us from a gruesome death in the heat of the moment, it's a really immersive way to interact with the environment. The act of using ordinary cupboards, tables or chairs for defence evokes a sense of vulnerability and you feel really helpless and underprepared for the first few nights. That sense of powerlessness is something that Darkwood really captures brilliantly. What's even more interesting is that Darkwood is actually procedurally generated. Each time you embark on a new run, you'll get a completely new, unique map, and even the rooms in the hideout vary as well, introducing another layer of complexity and difficulty depending on what you get. I've seen more than a few playthroughs of this game while writing this review, and as far as I know, the very first time you play the game, you'll end up with the same map or at least the very same starting hideout. The game is very clearly being designed from the ground up to encourage replayability, and if you want to experience everything Darkwood has to offer, you'll need to play the game more than once, and we'll look at this in more detail later on. As it starts to get dark, you'll notice the world around us slowly starts to change to a sickly orange hue, which indicates the sun is setting, and you'll need to stop what you're doing to get your ass home. Before we settle in for the night, I top up the generator in the garage, and honestly, having the power on makes the night times even more scary, and this is really cool. I put a stool by the front door to block any intruders, I craft a bandage in case things get messy and a plank for a weapon, and we sit and wait. The intensity of the night time is undeniable, at least in the early game. Despite having a bed, your character will refuse to sleep, and usually in video games the act of going home or going to bed and closing the door is a moment when your character feels safe. You're out of the storm and it's time to relax. Darkwood's day and night cycle is different to what you might find in other similar games. During the day you'll venture into the woods, gather resources, complete quests and so on, and then when night time falls there's no respite. You're forced to endure the night, which is often even more dangerous than the day. You're never safe, and you're never relaxed and this adds a wonderful, unique layer of tension to the experience. As the darkness descends, the atmosphere grows increasingly tense, and mysterious things start to happen. You'll experience unsettling groans and barely audible whispers, and if you're lucky, fully fleshed out occurrences like this start to happen. Eventually, the morning arrives in a cinematic fashion. The arrival of the morning brings a sense of relief, and as the music eases back into a warm, gentle tone, the atmosphere shifts from spooky horror back to natural forest soundscape, which is really cool. Playing Darkwood invokes feelings of solitude and loneliness, and so far I'm really enjoying myself. Speaking of loneliness, on the morning of your first night, you'll also encounter this strange fellow hanging out in your kitchen. Excuse me, did you break in, Mr. Uh, Wolfman? I honestly can't tell if this man is wearing a really believable mask, or if he's literally a wolf, and honestly neither would surprise me at this point. 
This is one of the first main characters that you'll meet, and when we introduce ourselves, he tells us that he knows what was taken from us, referring to the key that the doctor stole, but he'll only help us retrieve it if we help him first. Sure, I've played enough video games in my lifetime to know how this is going to go. Before trusting us, the Wolfman asks us to prove that we can handle this task, so he sets us a preliminary task. It's like those job interviews where instead of giving you the job, they make you work for free instead. The Wolfman tasks us to find him in his camp, located in the Silent Forest, which is adjacent to our current location. To help us find it, he marks it on our map. The Silent Forest is a bit more challenging than our current biome, so he warns us to be prepared before venturing forward. Most people in Darkwood, the ones that are alive that is, usually allow you to have a conversation with them, and the dialogue menu allows you to chat and get their opinions on items or topics you've encountered so far. Showing the Wolfman the photo of the road we found yesterday, he remarks that it doesn't exist anymore. But why the hell are these trees growing so fast? That's surely not normal, right? So after some conversation and trading, we now have our first main task. We need to locate the Wolfman in the Silent Forest, and in return, he'll help us find our key. Easy peasy. The Dry Meadow is the first biome of the game, and Chapter 1 is split up into three separate biomes. The Meadow, the Silent Forest, and the Old Woods. Each one becoming progressively harder and more dangerous. There isn't anything directly stopping you from going to the Old Woods right out of the gate on Day 1, but I wouldn't recommend it if you want to keep your internal organs intact. Before tackling the Silent Forest, there's a few locations in the Dry Meadow for us to check out, and while exploring, I encounter a burned house, crawling with flesh-eating dogs. Combat is simple to understand, and in the early game you'll probably be relying mostly on melee weapons. These dogs are trivial to take on one-on-one, -on -one, but when facing more than one at a time, things start to get a little hectic, because the field of vision mechanic severely limits what you can see behind and around your character model. In combat, timing is crucial, and when attacking you'll have a brief charge-up period before executing an attack. If you get hit while charging your weapon, it'll be cancelled, so it's important to be patient and strike at the right time. Sometimes well-timed attacks can cause enemies to lose their balance. It's a nice immersive way to keep combat feeling technically demanding while also retaining that defenselessness feeling you get from a good horror game. With the dogs taken care of, I begin to explore, and inside the house we find a single sofa, which could be moved to reveal a container and a small white dress. So we've got a house ravaged by forage fires, a chest that's obviously been hidden on purpose, and inside, an innocuous, innocent children's dress. This combination of the mundane and unusual underscores perfectly Darkwood's penchant for blending the ordinary with the obscure, and it really creates this wonderfully unsettling atmosphere. As I delve deeper into the burned house, rain starts to fall outside. The gentle patter of rain and the sounds of thunder and lightning flashing overhead creates a really captivating ambience. Considering this place is advertised as the dry meadow, it rains a lot. As the weather shifts, you'll notice the music changes subtly as well, intensifying the spooky atmosphere. Your field of vision will also be slightly diminished, to mimic the reduced awareness of having to contend with the sound and reduced visibility outside. Honestly, by this point I'd been playing for about two hours, and I really wanted to stop and put the game down and wait for it to get dark in real life, just so I could turn the lights off and put my headphones on because Darkwood is just that immersive. Even though it looks like a 2000s flash game, this has to be one of the most immersive games I've played in a really, really long time. In the garden we find another strange sight, a bright red seesaw contrasting against the drab, dreary forest, and I'd bet my lucky hat, if I had one, that this seesaw will be important later. By this point I wasn't sure what time of day it was, because I hadn't yet bought a watch. And that's not me trying to make a joke, watches can help you tell what time of day it is. Seriously, no matter how I phrase that, it's still gonna come out as a joke. In fear of being caught out with my proverbial trousers between my legs, I retreat to the hideout to prepare for nightfall, and on the way I encounter a deer. Well, that's cute. Oh god. On second thoughts, do not go near the deer. A nice rhyme to help you remember. Back at the hideout, nighttime arrives, and we switch on the generator to prepare to stand in our house until daytime. This is where the Reddit app on my phone comes in really handy. All is quiet until eventually I start to hear groaning, laughing, what the hell is that? These guys are called savages, and they're one of the main enemies you'll encounter in various forms. Normally they'll just wander into your house making awful noises, but they can also break down doors, windows and barricades as well, so you'll need to be on guard. Every night in Darkwood feels like an experience where I should be curled up in the corner of the room, rocking back and forth, chatting to myself like a madman. That's the level of immersion that Darkwood will throw at you, leaving you utterly powerless against the looming horrors that lurk outside. Halfway through the night, our generator runs out of fuel, and I'm left sitting in the dark, holding my torch, literally praying for daytime to arrive before I get mauled to death.
daytime rolls around and this time we get to meet another burglar. The trader is a unique NPC who appears in your hideout every morning, but with some exceptions. We can trade and chat like we can with Mr. Wolfman. Trading in Darkwood works slightly differently to how you might expect. Instead of relying on a traditional currency, transactions are conducted using reputation which you can earn by selling items, and each day your reputation with the trader will increase by 100, allowing you to save up if you're looking for something specific. Each morning time will freeze until you've left the hideout, so you get time to repair defenses, buy and sell, and take stock of items. It's a nice intermission, and probably one of the only times you're actually well and truly safe. If you were thinking that this guy looks familiar, well, you'd be right. He was the dude that saved us from the doctor's house a few days ago, and our character confirms this. The trader doesn't talk, for reasons unknown, and according to his dialogue, he communicates by writing notes and passing them to us. He suggests that we need to stick together, and I'm not sure if I can trust you yet, but I think we need to find at least one friend. There's a few items that the trader sells that I'd like to buy in the future, including a watch so we can tell what time it is, and upgrade items so we can upgrade our workbench and inventory capacity. He also sells various other odds and ends like fuel which we can use to avoid being mauled to death, which is nice. I prepare to leave for the day and as I do, I notice something strange. This invitation event can occur at any time, and it can only be found at the front door after experiencing the door knocking event from last night. I've heard this is completely random though, so you might get lucky and see it on day 3, or you might see it on day 20. The invitation, written in crude, childlike fashion, offers us to join in a celebration. We're given a location to a cornfield in the dry meadow, and at the bottom of a note, a code. I'm not one for passing up a party, so I put on my best torch and fanciest plank of wood, and I go and leave to take a look. Eventually we find the right place, or at least judging by this awkward confetti, I assume this is the right place. Navigating these fields is a wonderful use of the immersive line of sight mechanic, and every single twist and turn puts me on edge as I navigate the hedge maze. At the end I find a door which we can unlock with the code, and things start to get spooky. Exploring inside, you'll hear the unnerving music starting to rise, and I really love how the cracks in the barricades allow you to ever so slightly just peer into the next room. Unfortunately, this is where I got stuck, and after wandering around for a bit, I gave up and left. Many, many hours later, I realised that you can actually jump through unbarricaded windows, and this is the first instance where I noticed Darkwood's tendency to require you to use very simple mechanics, but you'll never be outright told that you can jump through this window. If I tell you that you can jump through windows, I'm probably sure that you won't forget it, but unless I told you that you could do it, it's just really easy to miss. And it's a shame that I wasn't able to complete this section in one go, because it's actually a really great set piece moment, but the immersion was kind of ruined for me. I jump through the window and in the background you'll hear this awful banging noise, and the tension starts to creep up. I'm not scared, you're scared. Outside, the banging continues, and we encounter more brides who encourage us to dance with them. After a slight panic and some unsettling moments, the music rises and suddenly, you'll notice that the groom's headbanging has stopped. And then this happens. The way the music combines with the rhythm of the creepy voice and the sudden attack from a very strong monster is really cool. There's quite a lot of pre-scripted horror events that happen throughout your time in Darkwood and they are by far the best part of the game. I would love to see what the developers could cook up if they removed the survival crafting mechanics and made a completely linear horror experience because honestly, I think it could be really great. Nearby the wedding venue I encounter a strange house and inside another hidden doorway, covered in strange pulsating mushrooms. 
These tunnels are actually quite dark, and you'll need to bring either a torch or a flashlight before coming down. The atmosphere when exploring these tunnels deep underground is actually quite intense. You'll hear the distant growling and barking of dogs in the background, so I'm guessing we aren't alone down here. There's also this weird pulsating mass, and I don't even want to know what that is. After some careful exploration, I uncover a bright light and a locked door, and this location is obviously important. The locked door is imprinted with the familiar number 21, and we can get the option to look through the keyhole, but without our key, we can't get through. So for now, I give up and leave, and while leaving the tunnels, things get spicy again. I'm telling you right now, I'm not going back down there without a good reason. For good measure, I move the cabinet back to block the passage, because that's definitely going to help me not get mauled to death inside the Tunnel of Doom. With nightfall closing in, I make my way back home, and refill the generator before it gets too dark. Even after pouring two full cans of gasoline into the tank, it's still not full. Darkwood is really good at using scarcity of resources to maintain that desperate atmosphere. I never found myself completely without resources, but certain items like fuel were always constantly in short supply. At least in the early game. The music begins to creep up again, and out of the corner of my eye, the door begins to slowly open. Please, I'm too young to die. I go to check the other room, and to my surprise, there's nothing there. After a few minutes, we hear someone in the next room, sitting on the bed begging to go home. There are a number of different events that have a chance of occurring during the night time, and some of them are actually really well done. The way the cracks are positioned perfectly allows you to just see enough of the silhouette, and that makes it even more unnerving. We go into the next room, and the mysterious creature is gone. Eventually, daytime arrives, and not the worst night ever. Except for, you know, the hallucinations and the breaking and entering, but it's all in good fun. Today I decide to make my way to the second biome in search of the Wolfman's camp. The silent forest is where the difficulty of the game starts to increase, and compared to the rest of the game, the dry meadow is a cakewalk. To get into the silent forest, you'll need to conquer a small house blocking the path. Inside the house, our character tells us that we'll need something to get rid of these toxic spores before we can progress. To get rid of the poison, we'll need to shine our light towards it, and you can either use a torch or a flashlight, but the game will never explicitly tell you what to do. You'll get a gentle nudge, giving you just enough information to keep things fair, and then you're on your own. If you look closely, you'll also see this body among the spores, and if you try and loot him, he won't have any useful items. He's simply there as a way to tell you, hey, this might kill you. After getting rid of the toxic stuff, we move further into the house, and we encounter a strange pulsating egg thing. And when we interact with it, our character tells us that it could probably be broken. I'm not sure if that's the best idea ever, to be honest, but breaking the egg, inside you'll find an embryo. Gross. If you're playing on hardcore mode, these can be consumed to grant extra lives, but otherwise they're just another way to get reputation from traders. Here we encounter our first mini-boss of sorts, and this nasty boy is the toughest enemy we've seen so far. Usually after encountering a tougher enemy for the first time, the game will introduce them in small set-piece moments, and then spread them across the game world from there onward, so it's a nice climactic way to introduce the player to tougher enemies. These savages wield staves with a really long melee range, making them difficult to fight if you're underprepared, especially if there's more than one of them. They do drop their staff though, and will be sticking with this weapon for quite a while due to its damage and its reach. After avoiding being violently beaten to death, I find a code for the door and make my way into the silent forest. Here you'll notice another corpse, which when looted grants a map, detailing a few points of interest in the silent forest. And we also get some shotgun shells. Nice. When we walk away, the corpse starts calling after us. Seriously, why does every dead person want to chat in this game? This specific conversation is actually quite important, but it won't make much sense right now. The corpse talks about some floorboards in a hideout, and when I first encountered this event, I thought it was referring to the next hideout. But this is actually a really large hint to the true ending of the game, and I'll explain it when we get there. Of course, as soon as we leave, I immediately forget anything and everything to do with this conversation, and I make my way into the Silent Forest. The Silent Forest marks a turning point in the narrative, and you'll be able to advance the story in several ways from here onward. I'll explain each interaction and its possible consequences as we go, but there's quite a lot of them, and you'll be required to play the game more than once if you want to see everything. The second hideout is considerably larger than the one in the Dry Meadow, and it contains similar amenities, and while exploring I find this strange bike bell. 
If you examine the bell, you'll find a message which prompts us to ring it. And when you do, you'll hear some unusual shuffling from outside. Eventually, the bike man shows up, and this guy reminds me a lot of the postman from Silent Hill Downpour, but much more ugly. For the cheap price of one alcohol, bike man will collect items from one hideout and deliver them to the other. After you pay him, he'll set off, and then the next morning you'll find a neatly wrapped parcel containing your items, which is really handy. I just wish I figured this out before I spent an hour moving items back and forth from the dry meadow. And speaking of new mechanics, it's time for us to figure out what this oven really does. I've been filling it with mushrooms and embryos for a while now. And that's another sentence I wasn't really expecting to say today. The syringe fills up and we get the option to level up. Leveling up happens each time you fill the syringe to the top, so it's worth thinking of mushrooms like experience points. A lot of the enemies in the game world also drop meat, which could be cooked, and this rots over time as well. Combat and the act of fighting enemies indirectly rewards experience through consumable items, increasing your power against those same enemies in the future. So it's actually a really well thought out system. Every time you level up, you'll be offered a perk, and at level 1, these will only be positive traits. At the higher levels, you'll be forced to choose from negative traits alongside a positive one. So there's a fair amount of variety in how you can build your character, from having the ability to negate traps once a day, or having an increased field of vision and so on. We'll have a better look at the negative traits later on. Leveling up in Darkwood also has the chance of triggering a dream sequence where your character will pass out on the kitchen floor, and you'll awake in a dream. After leveling up for the first time, you'll always get the tunnel dream, but there's three more dreams you can experience in any random order. We awaken in the same tunnels we explored earlier, and I'm happy to report that they aren't any less scary. In the distance, we hear someone calling us closer, eventually leading you to the locked door. This time though, the door opens and we're free to go through. This dream sequence is wonderfully implemented because the game knows that we need to get through this door, so this is teasing in a wonderful way to foreshadow future events. We encounter a small lamp on a wooden floor, and when we turn it on, the whole forest becomes engulfed by corpses. I won't pretend to understand what the hell just happened, but I'm sure it wasn't good. We awaken again on our kitchen floor, and I wait by myself in the garage until morning. Daytime arrives without much fuss, and it's time for us to seek out the Wolfman, who's actually quite close to the hideout. The Wolfman seems surprised to see us, and congratulates us on our efforts. Thanks. Now that we've impressed Wolf Senpai, he tells us that in the southern part of the Silent Forest there's a village, and inside, a hag who reeks of chickens. The Wolfman tells us that Chicken Lady, her official title, is keeping something which doesn't belong to her behind a locked door in her house. He requests that we bring him the key to that door, and in return he'll help us find the doctor. If you continue talking to him, the Wolfman also has a second quest, and he asks us to find a pig shed nearby. According to the Wolf, the villagers are hiding a secret, and he asks us to make the squealing stop. The Wolfman, as you might have already guessed, is a prick, and we'll explore this a bit more later. We set off to find the village, and on the way I encounter a wonderful interaction of a savage having a battle to the death with an elk. It's cool to see these creatures fighting each other in the forest, and thankfully neither of them notice me. So, I wait for Deer Man to kill the deer, and then I kill the Deer Man, and loot them both. Ah, the circle of life. We're also lucky enough to encounter a corpse, and this time when you interact with him, it explodes, causing enemies nearby to wake up and dealing a small amount of damage. So, now I'm never going to trust looting corpses ever again. Thanks game. We arrive at the entrance to the village in the south of the forest, and inside the village time will freeze, similar to mornings in the hideout, so you're free to explore at your own pace, which is really nice, because there's a lot of things that you might miss if you rush. Everywhere you look, you'll find villagers either going about their days, pottering around, or just muttering complete nonsense. I find a house, move the sofa, go into the cellar, and then this happens. We don't yet have any idea what's happening to these people, but don't worry, it'll become clear eventually. The village has lots of places to explore, and after wandering I find the chicken lady's house. And I know it's the chicken lady's house because the game kindly informs us that the floor is covered in chicken feces. This is another great example of Darkwood combining visual gameplay elements with narrative storytelling to create that horrific image within your imagination. Darkwood is a great example of how a game can be incredible without incredible graphics. This shriveled mess is the chicken lady, and she makes it clear that she doesn't want us anywhere near her precious hens. You can talk to the woman and interact with her just like any other character. And when showing her our plastic chicken, she perks up. Chicken Lady informs us that this toy belonged to her brother Janik, who disappeared a few days ago. She shows us a photograph of the man who Janik disappeared with, and this is clearly the doctor. 
From this interaction, we can come to the conclusion that the man who intact us inside the house was Janik, Chicken Lady's brother. And unfortunately, we know what happened to him because we caved his face in with a table leg. And now I feel bad. The Chicken Lady gives us a cryptic message, telling us that the sow provides food to the village. Another strange, seemingly pointless line, but this is actually quite important and I'll explain why later. I don't have long to ponder though because our conversation gets interrupted by a strange squeaking sound. This tractor is the musician. Wait, sorry, that face threw me off. The musician is under the tractor. The fearful childlike portrayal of this strange character is actually really awesome. If I had to choose, I'd say that the musician is my favorite character in the whole game. He apologizes for playing his violin and asks if we've been speaking to Chicken Lady. And when we agree, he asks if we've seen the Pretty Lady, who according to the musician is the most beautiful person he's ever seen. I've not seen this woman yet, but going by everything that's happened so far, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's completely false. He reveals that the pretty lady is locked inside the house, which mirrors what we heard from the wolf. And he tells us that the key to the door can be found inside Jan's house. So from this interaction, we can deduce that we need to find a way inside Janik's house to retrieve the key, but it's currently locked with no way inside. After some more nonsense, the musician reveals that he thinks there might be something inside the well in the middle of the village. So we'll start there. He tells us he'll be waiting for his key at the place where they keep the grain and then disappears. I visit the well and to venture inside, you'll need to repair it with a chain. Thankfully, you can find two chains nearby, or you can purchase them from various characters, including my second favorite character who we've not yet met. Inside, you'll be faced with another harrowing tunnel sequence. And by this point in the game, I was nervous to see what the game might throw at us next. Eventually, we start to hear some distant growling and the floor begins to swell with pus, blood and gore. I waste no time down in that awful tunnel and at the other side, we end up in Janik's house. And here we find a key to the chicken lady's locked door. Thankfully, you can open the door from this side so we don't have to go back into that hellhole again. Now that we've got the key, we have a choice. And this is one of the most important choices you'll make in Darkwood. We can choose to side with the musician or the wolf, both who want the key to the pretty lady's room. Depending on which character you side with will affect the game in drastic ways. I created a new game just to see what would happen when siding with each character. We'll look at the musician's side first. If you decide to help the strange musical child, you'll find him in the silo, in the place where they make the grain, of course. You'll know that you found the right place when you start to hear melodious sounds of cats being strangled. The musician thanks us for helping him and reveals his true appearance. And I can see why your music sounds so bad. Your violin is literally a rectangle. The kid asks for one more favor and tells us that he's planning to make Pretty Lady his wife. But before he can do that, he needs a better violin to impress her. After reattaching his face, he asks if we would go to his parents' house and ask them to lend us their better violin. And spoilers, this one is also a square. I love this whimsical childlike storytelling combined against the backdrop of this very obviously horrifying story. And the way the game blends innocent themes and horror vibes together is actually really well done. If you choose to help the musician, he'll offer you a drawing and you need to visit his parents' house in the old woods, the third biome and final location of chapter one. And this is where things get interesting. Inside the house, you'll find two disheveled people. And I assume these are the musician's parents, including what appears to be the boy's mother, half dead in the bath. Searching the nearby wardrobe reveals a violin, hidden on the wall behind it. But if you decide to take it outright, the poor woman will protest. Like I said, Darkwood is a game all about subtle choices and the outcome of these choices. And there's a few ways that you can progress here. If you simply take the violin from the wall and leave, the parents will turn into horrible red chompers. Instead, you can give the drawing obtained from the musician to his mother by leaving it on her corpse. And in return, she'll allow you to retrieve the violin without being attacked. But remember, every decision has its own consequences. I take the violin back to the kid and he concludes that since we were able to obtain the violin, it must mean that his parents are no longer angry with him. So he decides to move back home. In return for helping him, the musician gives us the location of the doctor and tells us that he set up a meeting in a train wreck in the old woods. And what a nice quest. The ending was just really nice and no, this is Darkwood after all. If you go back to the musician's house the next day, you'll find a series of events have occurred, which differ slightly depending on the choices that you've made. Arriving at the house, the music starts to ramp up again and we find the musician's corpse in the middle of the room, ripped in half. I honestly felt bad for this character because unlike most other people in the game, the musician wasn't malicious. He was just an innocent kid. 
Opting to take the violin without leaving the drawing causes the parents to turn into monsters, and they'll attack you on the spot. If you spare them during the transformation, or leave the drawing on the mother's corpse, the musician will be attacked and killed. However, if you decide to kill them yourself in their human or monster forms, you'll find the musician outside his house burying his parents, and he'll refuse to speak to you. And technically, this is the good ending. There aren't many games out there that do meaningful choice, and Darkwood is unique in that respect because there's a lot of choices that you can make, and some of them can be quite impactful. I found myself wanting to replay the game just to simply see what would happen if I took a different turn. In a completely different set of events, if you instead decide to give the Wolfman the key, he'll tell you to meet him in the complex, which is also located in the old woods. When you arrive, he'll show you the half-eaten corpse of the pretty lady, and he'll reward you with a hunting rifle for your efforts, one of the best weapons in the game. He'll also give you the location of the doctor inside the train rack. If you decide to go down this route, this prevents the Wolfman from reappearing in Chapter 2. So, now we know the two choices. We can either help Music Man or Wolfman, but when I played, I took a completely different option because somehow I managed to miss the musician the first time around. But we all know by now that I'm not smart enough for video games. I decided instead to break into the chicken lady's house and murder both her and the pretty lady. And if you choose to do it this way, you'll find a note on the chicken lady's corpse with a location to the doctor's house instead of his location in the train rack. There's quite a few different branching storylines, and each one slightly affects how the game plays out, both in Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, and we'll look at more of these differences as they crop up. It's been a long day, so I make my way back home from the village and encounter a new enemy, the Boomer. Sorry, I mean the Mushroom Man. Back at home I wait for nightfall, and now nighttime is starting to become quite difficult. The problem arises with the long periods of inactivity, which can stretch on for quite a while before anything interesting happens, and you're forced to wait it out. With night times lasting several minutes at a time, I often found myself passing the time by fiddling around on my phone, either until something fun happened or daytime arrived, and this started to feel quite monotonous at times. After a few levels of Candy Crush, this happens. Banshees are by far my least favourite enemy in the game. When you look at them, you'll start to hallucinate, and if you get too close, they'll begin to scream relentlessly, causing the lights to go out, and eventually the Banshee itself will explode into a million tiny Banshee babies. These babies are no joke, and there's so many of them that you'll often find yourself wedged into a corner, completely helpless. And it's even worse when the lights go out. Morning arrives and I take the time to do some housekeeping. I upgrade the workbench which allows us to craft better items, including some single shot firearms which break after use. As you upgrade the workbench, you'll need to use unique or expensive items like the plier or the toolbox. Although this is where my one complaint with crafting comes in. Sometimes it's difficult to figure out what components are required in any one recipe. When you hover over an item, it'll show a pop-up informing you of what items are required to craft. But rather than telling you its name, you'll only get the icon itself, and these can be really ambiguous. So you'll need to use the online wiki a lot, which is a shame. I also level up again after cooking some mushrooms, and this time we get to choose a negative perk alongside a positive one. I choose the acid blood perk, which causes our blood to damage enemies in an area of effect. And I pick the vulnerability to poison negative trait, which causes us to take more damage from poison. And I'm sure I won't regret that one later. After leveling up, we get another dream sequence. This time we awake in a forest near a church, equipped with its very own ringing bells. Inside the church, I notice a swirling black mass floating around a trap door. And when we turn around, a whole line of people spring into view, as if queuing to go down. This is another unique use of the camera mechanics to create a scary situation, and it works really well. You'll only see these people if you're looking directly at them. The trap door is locked with a key code, preventing us from going down, which I'm not really that upset about, to be honest. I find another locked door, explore a creepy graveyard, find a corpse with a smile on its face, and eventually a lockpick.
Notice how the weird black monster started ranting about a red seesaw, a white dress and a black box. We've seen all of these items previously, and the black box we've just picked up. This whole sequence is a reference back to the burned house we explored earlier. If you manage to kill the monster, he'll drop a medallion, which shows a horribly distorted photograph of two children. From this photo and the shouting, we can infer that this monster might be the father of the two children. Unfortunately, this guy is really strong, and he kills me without much trouble. If you die or escape the church in the dream, this location is filled with stronger monsters when we inevitably visit it later in the real world. If you instead manage to kill the Black Tromper here in the dream, the monsters will be replaced with less threatening dogs instead. I really like how the developers actively reward the player for accomplishing an optional, intentionally difficult encounter. And by doing so, you'll be rewarded with a less stressful encounter later on. So I get mauled to death, and afterwards I reawaken in the hideout, and in our inventory now we have a black box. So I'm not sure if it was a dream after all. Regardless of the outcome, the morning after this dream you'll be visited by the Wolfman again. He tells us to find a key in the old woods, and in return he'll help us open the box. With that out the way, I set out to explore and encounter another savage. These guys are the same as the ones that we've seen previously, but this time, they'll simply throw rocks at you and run away. Is it me, or do these guys look like they've just shit themselves? We encounter another plot of land, and whoever lives here seemingly has begun collecting random items, salvaged from various machinery, including broken tractors. Maybe they're a mechanic. I find a blueprint in the nearby chest, and I use the term blueprint very loosely. When I first saw this drawing, I thought it was a drawing of the church, but if you look closely, you'll actually notice a rocket, and this is the makings of our next quest. I've changed my mind. Whoever lives here is probably not a mechanic, but rather a maniac. In the adjacent building, you'll find Piotrick, a strange man with a colander for a hat with vibrating tentacles, which he refers to as metal wigglies. Definitely a maniac. Piotrick will spout absolute gibberish at you until you show him a specific set of mechanical items. Items which you can find randomly in the world, mostly inside broken machinery. These have no value whatsoever, and you can't sell them to traders, and they're otherwise completely useless. Showing Piotrick at least one of these items causes him to become excited. He'll ask us to help him build a rocket inside his garage. Cool, it's not like I've got anything more important to do. To complete this quest, you'll need to find four of six of these useless items, handily drawn on the rocket blueprint. There's actually two ways to complete this quest, and by giving the items to Piotrick, he'll reward you with a welder, a rare item used to upgrade the workbench. If you instead show the parts to the Wolfman, he'll suggest that the spaceship needs to be sabotaged, and will instead turn the parts into a bomb. I told you earlier, the Wolfman is a prick. Whichever choice you choose will cause Piotrick to disappear for the rest of Chapter 1, and one of two outcomes will occur in Chapter 2, and we'll catch up with Piotrick later to see how he's getting on. Nearby Piotrick's house, I also discover a very large set of farm buildings, and this location is known as the Pig Shed, and it's one of the most dangerous and ambient places in the Silent Forest. As you explore, the music starts to become eerie and atmospheric, filling the air with sounds of bubbling mushrooms and squealing pigs, which is actually quite strange considering most of the pigs are dead. Maybe they're ghost pigs. After some exploration, I encounter some less than friendly villagers, and these guys will attack you if you get too close. They're not very dangerous, but they do drop the pitchfork, which is one of my favorite weapons. The pitchfork is amazing, and it has really long reach compared to our other melee weapons, but its durability is really low, so you won't be able to use it for more than a few hits. But it's great to be able to fight these villagers pitchfork versus pitchfork. The Pitchfork is also one of the only weapons in the game to have a set of unique animations, and sometimes our character will get stuck if you hit a wall, which is a nice touch. Eventually we find a large room and things start to get creepy again. This monstrosity is the So, an extremely large and deformed pig, and we know that this pig has been providing a food source for the villagers in the south. If you recall, the Wolfman told us about the So earlier, and tasked us with murdering it. Another example as to why the Wolfman is just out to ruin everyone's day. If you want to follow the Wolfman's quest, you'll need to end the poor pig's life, and you can do this in a few ways. You can either kill it manually, which isn't recommended because going near the thing will likely result in a swift death. If you explore a bit more, you'll find an odd set of electrical cables leading to a machine with a lever. And before we can turn it on, you'll need to find a cable to repair the broken one outside. Once the machine has been repaired, we're faced with a choice, and killing the pig will complete the Wolfman's quest and reward you with an inventory upgrade item. Inventory upgrades can either be found as rare quest rewards like this, or crafted in the workbench, and these require expensive items, so this is a pretty decent reward in the mid-game. If you decide to kill the so, all of the other pigs nearby start to become hostile, so you'll want to get the hell out as soon as possible. As we know, choices in Darkwood are often quite meaningful, and killing the so has some noticeable consequences. Visiting the southern village again after this sequence will cause the villagers to huddle together while mourning the loss of their very important source of food. I do quite like this quest overall, because while it is still quite cryptic, there's quite a lot of hints left through the game to let you know what might happen if you do decide to kill the so. The villagers then tried to coerce me down into the basement of one of the nearby houses, and if you follow them, you'll be ambushed by some very hungry, very angry villagers. 
hangry. It's a technical term. These types of poignant but not totally game-breaking consequences are really pretty good because they'll never ever cause you to completely brick your run, but will change things just slightly enough to ensure that you as a player feel like your narrative decisions are weighty and impactful. If you want a rule of thumb, anything that comes out of the Wolfman's mouth is probably the evil choice. Now that we've explored the majority of the important locations in the Silent Forest, it's time for us to move into the old woods. So for the next few in-game days, I take some time to prepare. I buy some parts from the trader to craft some useful items, including a handgun and a lantern. The lantern acts like a passive light source. When equipped on the hotbar, it creates a small aura of light around your character, which is really handy when fighting in the dark. Nighttime rolls around and I hunker down for my final night in the Silent Forest. And this is where my gripes of the night start to become really apparent. Nighttime can be described in two ways. You'll either be fending off enemies desperately trying to survive, or you'll be casually playing old school RuneScape on your second monitor. There's no in between. I do really like the ambience of the nighttime attacks though. The sound of the savages hammering away at your windows, the lights flickering and the screen shaking, all really create a claustrophobic atmosphere. I'm really glad to have the pistol for this part because things start to get really hectic. The shooting mechanics in Darkwood are actually quite good. In fact, the whole combat system feels good. Shooting works similarly to the melee combat, and the way it's designed makes you still feel vulnerable. Firearms aren't immediately going to make you feel like the Terminator. And I really like this because it keeps with the whole horror vibe. With the firearm equipped, you can aim the crosshair by pressing the right mouse button, and the longer you aim, the more accurate you'll be. If you shoot quickly or move around a lot while aiming, you'll probably end up missing most of your shots. Darkwood is a horror game after all, so it's nice to see that even with a gun, two or more enemies can still prove a challenge. Daytime finally arrives, and I make my way into the third and final biome of chapter one. In the middle of the woods, I find hideout number three, and this one is a lot bigger and more awkwardly arranged than the other two, which is a nice way to increase difficulty by forcing the player to think outside the box when picking a place to defend. I try my best to move some of the furniture around the house, but after spending like 20 minutes, I gave up. I feel like Ross in that episode of Friends. I spend my first night here, and again, nighttime is a little underwhelming. Compared to the first hideout where you'll experience creepy hallucinations, ghosts, doors opening slowly and so on, nighttimes are more challenging, but a lot less interesting overall. If you can't be asked to wait it out, you can kill yourself to be immediately transported to daytime, which is handy. And I'm not gonna lie, in the later stages of the game, I started to abuse this quite a lot. Morning arrives, and thankfully our old friend the trader is still here. We learned earlier that this poor fellow can't speak, and instead he reveals a tattoo on his arm, which states that the forest wants to devour us, and that we're heading straight into its jaws. I'm not sure if that's words of wisdom or just random gibberish, but we'll keep it in mind. After leveling up again we get another dream, and this time we awake in a relatively normal looking house. It's a stark contrast to be exploring a normal house in a normal urban environment, and a welcome change from the forest environments we've suffered through so far. I assume that this is our character's house in the city, and there's not much to do here, but things start to become quite disturbing again. When we open the door, no one's there, and we fade to black. I reawaken again on the kitchen floor and make my way to the church, which we saw in our previous dream. Traversing through the old woods is more challenging than the other biomes due to the lack of light and abundance of difficult enemies and poisonous mushrooms littered around, so you'll need to move slowly and carefully to avoid a swift death. The church is almost identical to the version we saw in our dream, and some things will be slightly different depending on the actions that you took. If you didn't kill the black chomper in the dream, you'll find a madman spouting nonsense about flowers for his little girls. If you did manage to fend off and kill the chomper during the dream sequence, you'll find this man dead on the floor. This is an interesting revelation and essentially proves that black chompers used to be real people who are now morphed into monsters. In this case, this is the father of the two children who lived in the burned house in the dry meadow. Getting close to the man, he'll call you a coward. I assume due to the fact that we lost to him during the dream sequence, and he'll try to goad you into going into the basement. Killing this man in the real world, he'll drop another medallion, which in the dream was a horribly morphed photograph of two children. But the medallion in the real world is a normal photo. Interesting. But the code to the trapdoor can be found on the medallion. But to get this medallion, the madman has to die. So the game essentially requires you to murder a person to get inside this basement. 
The basement itself is an absolute hellhole and is by far the hardest area we've had to deal with so far. If you kill the chomper during the dream, the basement will be filled with less threatening dogs. But if you didn't manage to kill the chomper, the basement will be filled to the brim with more difficult red chompers, which explode out of bodies in all directions. I died about five times trying to clear out this area. I found it really difficult to fight because the exit to the basement isn't a door that you have to interact with, but rather a hole which automatically moves between game scenes. So if you accidentally swap location, the whole fight resets. So this area became less of a scary set piece moment and more of a combat chore, which was a shame. Eventually I clear the area and at the end of the room you'll encounter rows and rows of beds with half dead corpses littering around. Combining this with the ambience of the music, the flickering of lights and the claustrophobic tunnels actually makes this area quite unnerving, which is great. The only notable loot down here is the twisted key, which if you recall we learned could be used to open the strange box, but we'll need to give the key to the wolfman for him to open it for us, and inside you'll find a collection of children's drawings. These drawings have no physical use whatsoever, but does give an insight into events prior to our arrival. These drawings essentially tell the tale of a plague, which spread through the forest causing people to leave their homes and lose their loved ones, and causing houses to be burned down to stop the plague from spreading. In an attempt to cure the plague, the residents moved into a makeshift hospital in the church basement where things went from bad to worse, leaving the patients either dead or turned into monsters, the family included. Learning of the mysterious plague, we can start to begin to understand why certain locations and characters are what they are. They aren't just crazy people, but they've been driven to madness and sickness through the illness that swept the forest. We'll learn more about the story later on, but for now our next destination is the doctor's house, the location of which was revealed through a note on the chicken lady's corpse. The doctor's house is located on the eastern side of the forest, and like the village, time freezes here to allow you to explore. I've been itching to explore this location since the beginning of chapter 1, so I'm excited to see what's inside. This location is interesting because you'll see furniture that when directly looked at is no longer there, indicating that this is a memory that our character has of this house before it was rearranged, which is a really awesome use of the already established fog of war mechanic. I noticed that a lot of the doctor's stuff has been cleared out and underneath the carpet we find a locked safe. This is a small environmental puzzle and if you look carefully you'll find very small numbers marked on the floor with scratches linking them together. Putting the numbers in the right order allows you to unlock the safe. Inside the safe you'll find a completely useless toy rocket and this has no in-game use and it's not worth anything to traders either so it's not worth collecting. We also find a map depicting the doctor's current location. We already know where the doctor is from the ending of the musician and the wolfman questlines but if you progress near the questline this is how you'll find him. There's not much else of interest here, but you'll notice the poor dog is still here from the start of the game. If you decided to mercy kill the dog like I did, his corpse will still be here. But if you didn't kill him at the start of the game, he'll be wandering around the house and you'll have to fight him. So you'll have to kill him either way. Another example of very small, completely optional choices with very meaningful outcomes. While a lot of these choices are not admittedly mind-blowing or game-changing, because there's so many small decisions to make, they really start to add up and a second or even third playthrough of the game will likely have a lot of differences depending on which choices you made. We continue our search for the Doctor and we arrive at the train wreck, and this meeting can play out differently depending on your choices so far. If you don't complete the musician's quest, the Doctor will be unaware of you and this allows you to get the jump on him. He'll refuse to give you the key that he stole and accuses us of being an outsider, or in other words, someone who never originally lived in the forest. He laments that the area has been completely destroyed, and from our escapades in the church, we can assume that the plague has swept through the entire forest, causing the majority of its inhabitants, including the doctor himself, to go insane. He reveals that he's looking for his little girl, which is why he took our key in the first place. From here, we have the option to either reveal the location of the door, or we can just leave or kill him, whatever you want to do. If you decide to spare the doctor, he'll ask you to meet him at the underground tunnel and then he'll leave. If you instead find this location through the musician, the doctor will be prepared for your arrival and he'll ambush you, causing you to experience an entirely optional, completely missable dream sequence in which you can learn the events of the doctor's past. Given that we now sort of understand what's happening, I start to feel bad for the doctor, so I decide to spare his life and allow him to come with us. No matter what choice you make, our next logical step is the underground door in the dry meadow. And depending on how you've played out chapter one, the doctor will either accompany you or steal your key and leave the door open for you to follow behind. The game informs us that chapter 2 is a one-way street, and you can never go back to chapter 1. 
so it's worth staying around for a few more nights if you need to prepare. After grabbing the essentials, I make my way back into the horrible tunnel and venture through the door. Going through the armoured door, I find a pile of oozing debris and a man still alive trapped underneath. Although I'm struggling to see anyone here. Can you? After yanking a small stone out of his own forehead, the man dies and while we were distracted, the doctor runs off ahead. Typical. The next section of the game is actually quite spooky, and you'll be forced to navigate flooded underground tunnels filled with strange voices, and then this happens. The Swampers are hands down the worst enemies in the whole game. You'll only find them in Chapter 2 onwards and only within water, which when you see where Chapter 2 takes place is everywhere. Thankfully this one disappears before it has a chance to attack us, but this is another nice introduction to a new enemy and a good element of foreshadowing. This whole mini location is actually quite cool and reminds me a lot of the dream sequences. You'll need to move through the location as fast as possible to conserve flashlight batteries, but at the same time, trying to avoid the water in fear of the swamp monsters is really tense. We come across dry land and we find a tree. Okay, I'll admit game, that one got me. This tree reminds me of the Deku tree from Zelda, but much more disgusting. At the end of the tunnel, we emerge from a trap door and into a swamp. Chapter 2 consists of only one biome, about the same size as the old woods, containing its own unique set of locations, characters, quests, and another hideout. The swamp hideout is similar to the others, containing all the essentials for survival, but this time we find a broken compressor and littered around some old disused gas canisters. I assume this is going to be something that we'll need to use later, and I really hope it's not another mechanic that we have to manage. Outside you'll also notice these weird spooky eyeballs on the floor. These are called growths and they're made up of two parts, the eyeball and the weird tentacle growth thingy. If you look at the eye directly, it'll close, and the tentacle will open up for a short period of time before closing again. This is another mechanic that we'll need to use to unlock specific paths in the future, but other than that, they're really just creepy, especially at night. The astute among you will also notice this locked door, which can only be opened if you make some very specific choices in chapter one. If you decide to complete the Wolfman's path in Chapter 1, you'll find this door open in Chapter 2, and inside, the musician makes his final appearance. The poor kid has been ostracized from the village in the Silent Forest, and he'll live here in this room, very slowly being overtaken by the plague. The player can choose to interact with him and feed him normal food, which will cause him to slowly mutate, but if you feed him cookable items like meat or mushrooms, his transformations will speed up. Eventually, you'll find him becoming larger and more monstrous as the days go by, but if you leave him to turn, he'll eventually disappear, leaving the room coated in a strange slime, and it'll damage you if you go inside. I think out of everyone we've met in Darkwood, the musician was probably the nicest and most mistreated character in the whole game. Outside the house, we find a crate with a note, depicting information from the previous inhabitants who recall a large tree growing very quickly in the village to the south. No, this is the second southern village. Yeah, I know it's confusing. We also learn of a few more locations in the swamp, including the junkyard, which contains some parts to fix a compressor, and according to the note, a cottage near the junkyard with someone living inside. Thankfully, these locations are marked on our map, so we have a few more breadcrumbs to follow. The village is really close to the hideout, so I decide to explore this location first, and inside we encounter another new enemy. It's no secret that I hate these human spiders. They're made up of what looks like amalgamated body parts to create this nightmare fuel. One on one, they're not difficult to kill, but they run really fast, and whenever you encounter them, you'll probably have to stop and fight. The spiders throw their own body parts at you if you move out of melee range, and each time they do, a new spider will emerge from the limb. Aside from being disgusting, this is really annoying because sometimes one spider ends up turning into about four. This coupled with the difficult to navigate swamp waters which slow you down, makes the human spider my least favorite enemy. The Swamp Village is hands down one of the most difficult locations in the whole game, and it's jam-packed full of deadly enemies, and some entirely new ones, including dogs, boomers, spiders, swampers, you name it, it's in the village. The village is also really cryptic in its layout, with broken houses and tree roots and water blocking most of the paths, so you'll likely have to spend a few days and deaths trying to explore this area. After some spelunking, we find the Doctor, huddled near a strange shrine. 
If you decide to spear the doctor in chapter one, you'll find him in a few locations all over the swamp, and each time you talk to him, he'll look more and more decrepit. Even though the doctor was a complete asshole to nearly everyone in the game, I do have some sympathy because he was pushed to the brink of desperation, like everyone else that we've met. You won't learn anything useful from the doctor at this point in the game, and if you speak to him, he'll reveal that he's searching for his daughter again. If you show him a photo of the road, he'll get angry and demand you to tell him where it is. After more exploration, we encounter the cripple. This crazy fellow lost his legs in World War II, and now, instead of a wheelchair, he's got what looks like a wooden wheelbarrow. I think we need a tier list of who got the shortest end of the stick in Darkwood. My vote would be either this guy or the musician. Let me know in the comments. Who do you think had the worst luck? The cripple tells us that he used to be a pig farmer, and that the military burned down his land in an attempt to contain the plague. Being the only remaining survivor in the village, everyone else either left or died. He laments that this place was once a very normal village, with fields and farmers, and everything changed the day the tree sprouted. People starved to death, fighting over food until the whole forest was either destroyed or burned down. This whole area is in a much worse state than the other locations in the game, which suggests that whatever caused this mess is probably located in the swamp, eventually spreading out through the whole forest. The cripple tells us a bit more about the tree, which is apparently made up of human faces. He suggests that we go into a nearby basement to access the roots, and suggests that we burn the tree to a crisp. If you explore the village a bit more, you'll eventually find the tree, and as suggested, this thing is massive, made up of human body parts. As you get closer, you'll start to hear whispers. Interacting with the tree, we get a few options. Climbing the tree doesn't work because the corpse has tried to pull us inside, and we can't kick it down because the limbs regrow almost immediately. This is an important revelation, and something you'll likely miss the first time around. Why does the tree regrow its limbs? I eventually find the basement that the cripple was talking about, and inside, you'll find the inner roots of the tree. This location is actually really cool, because you'll need to avoid looking directly at the tree or you'll suffer some small amounts of damage over time. So it's obvious that this tree is a bad idea. I find a completely flooded passageway and when trying to explore, we get a message telling us that we need an oxygen tank to progress, and so begins the main objective of chapter 2. At this point in the game, I was still struggling to understand everything, but the game leaves a lot of hints as to why we might want to destroy the tree. For example, the tree itself seems to be hoarding bodies like a self-expanding graveyard, and the fact that even looking at the tree causes pain and even death if you look at it for too long. In the swamp specifically, you'll also be attacked by roots of the tree itself, which sprout out of the ground. This is actually really annoying, because the roots cause unpreventable damage, and you'll have to wait it out. There's no skill or luck involved. You'll either die or you'll survive. You can also look back and find some other hints about the tree as well, including the fact that the forest seems to be growing faster and faster, seemingly engulfing whole locations. The story will become clear at the end of chapter 2, but for now, destroying this tree seems to be our only chance of escape. Going back to the cripple again, I tell him that we found the tree, but we can't get near it due to a lack of an oxygen tank. To this, the cripple informs us of the elephants, who live in the northwest of the swamp. According to him, the elephants might have an oxygen tank that we can borrow. Why there are elephants in a swamp, though, remains a mystery. With the village explored and dusk rolling in, it's time to go home to prepare for nightfall. Nighttime in the swamp is similar to chapter 1, and the only real difference being that enemies are no longer location specific, meaning that you can now face any and all enemies, making nighttime even more of a challenge. After a while, the lights start to flicker and all the furniture starts being pulled towards the tree itself. Seriously, what is wrong with this place? Daytime arrives and I set out to explore the cottage in the north of the swamp, and before leaving I encounter the trader again, or more specifically the corpse of the trader. Interacting with the body, we find some interesting loot, including a copy of our key and a journal which looks morphed and twisted. 
The real question is though, why does this guy have a copy of our key? I feel bad for the trader because this is one of the very few characters in the game who doesn't cause us any trouble. And now and again in chapter one, he would leave useful items for free like cans of gas. So it's obvious that he wanted to help us. Who killed him though remains a mystery. I assume it was either the plague or the forest itself. And now that the poor trader is dead, he'll be replaced by three strangers known as the three. And these creepy characters will allow you to buy and sell stuff each day, which is handy. I make my way north to check some of the locations we've uncovered, and just like the village, navigating the swamp is a lot more dangerous than the forest locations we've become accustomed to. We encounter a lake and on the shore, the doctor. Talking to him here, you'll notice that he's even more shriveled than before, and he's starting to remind me of the savages that we fought previously. This is quite an interesting revelation, because it's here that we start to understand what's happening to the forest and its inhabitants, being slowly twisted and warped by the plague. And we can now experience it firsthand by seeing the doctor becoming more and more disfigured each time we meet him. In the north, we encounter the cottage identified on the map, and as we move closer, a number of voices begin to call out to us, begging to be freed. In the house, or more specifically on top of the house, you'll find a massive snail, which retreats into its shell as we approach. Inside the shell of the snail, we can have a conversation with it. And if you remember, the note we found earlier told us that someone was living here. We know from experience that people are turning into monsters, but whoever living here seems to have been changing into a gigantic snail. It's pretty disgusting, and when talking to its horrible face, it tells us that we are ugly. Excuse me, have you looked in a mirror recently? Because I have, and I look a lot better than you. The snail continues, waffling on about gum boots, and seriously, nothing surprises me anymore. The game could throw anything at me, and I probably wouldn't bat an eyelid. The snail tells us that he's trapped inside the house. I assume due to the fact that he's the biggest snail ever created, and he asks us to help him get free, extending his gooey snail hand to give us a key to the nearby shed. To free the snail, you'll need to unlock the shed, look at the eye to cause it to shrink away, revealing a hidden area in which you'll find a cord which you can cut to free the snail. Another good introduction to the eye mechanic if you've not yet figured it out. Inside the shed, you'll also find another map, referencing scrap piles in the junkyard. And if you look closely, you'll notice the compressor parts that we need are marked on one of the scrap piles. This is another example of why I like the progressive storytelling of Darkwood so much. A lot of the game can be simply brute forced or solved by trial and error, but if you take the time to explore each location, almost every single area has some sort of breadcrumb leading you to the next point of interest. In this case, we now know the exact location in the junkyard for the compressor, which reduces the need for us to dig randomly, breaking multiple shovels in the process. The snail thanks us for freeing him, and he tells us that he'll be gone by tomorrow and that we can live here if we want to. I think I'll pass on that one, but I'll come back tomorrow when you've managed to get your fat, slimy ass out of the cottage. Next, I decide to visit the junkyard, and this is another location that will change depending on the choices that you make in chapter one. We know from the maps that we need to dig in scrap heap F for the compressor parts, so I grab them first. As we explore the junkyard, I notice something weird. This is Piotrick, or more specifically, what remains of poor Piotrick. If you remember in chapter one, we gave him some scrap parts to help him build his rocket, and we left him to venture into space. From this, we can assume that his plan didn't go according to plan, and he ends up here, which is a bummer. Choosing to help Piotrick build his rocket causes him to end up here with the rocket nearby, and if you look inside, you'll find a huge amount of useful supplies. If you instead decided to help the wolfman sabotage the rocket, you'll instead find his body but no rocket nearby, suggesting that the sabotage was successful. Either way, causing Piotrick to blast off into space in chapter 1 will always cause him to end up here, replacing the enemies in this location, so in a roundabout way we get another subtle reward in the form of a less difficult encounter later on, similar to the church and the dream from earlier. The doctor can also be found here for a third time in the junkyard, and this time he's barely recognizable. Talking to him, he looks identical to the savage, and this time, instead of speaking, he simply eats his own tongue. There isn't much to gather from this, but we do get to see firsthand what happens when the plague finally takes over. At this point, there's no more interaction to be had with the doctor, and you can either leave him to eventually die, or you can put him out of his misery. Back in the village, the cripple kindly told us of the elephant people who might be able to help us acquire an oxygen tank located in a small hut in the swamp. This area is tricky to navigate because you'll be forced to contend with huge thickets of trees and lots of water, which causes you to lose your stamina faster. So patience is required to navigate this area. Due to the overgrowth of trees, you'll also need a flashlight because this place is really dark. After wandering around, I encounter a small village and the outside garden will be completely riddled with traps. When coming here for the first time, I didn't realize that the swaying graphics underneath my character's feet was actually tall grass, swaying in the wind. And this grass obscures some of the bear traps, so you'll need to move slowly if you want to stay alive. Eventually we arrive and inside a voice calls out from behind a locked door. The person on the other side asks us to prove that we're trustworthy and asks us to repair the generator outside. Thankfully, all we need to do is salvage some scrap metal from the bear traps in the garden. 
To prove that I'm nice, I will dismantle all of your garden defenses and then repurpose them into lights. Please trust me. Turning on the lights, the strange voice invites us inside. And now I can understand why the cripple thought that these people were elephants. The entirety of chapter 2 is actually really well done, and I love how in chapter 1 you'll still be navigating a location that still resembles a normal forest and a normal village. In chapter 2 you'll face the true reality of the plague and the destruction left behind, when it's left to truly fester. The elephant mother tells us that they've managed to stay alive by wearing gas masks, which explains why they seem to be the only normal people left. She thanks us for repairing the generator by accusing us of kidnapping her third son, who left home one day and never returned. In exchange for an oxygen tank, the mother requests that we find the missing son. Here you'll also notice that the children start to recite a strange poem, or at least part of a strange poem, and right now it sounds like gibberish, but take note because it'll be useful very soon. Before leaving, the mother gives us a key to the bedroom and inside we find a drawing. The child is located in the mushroom glade, not far from the cottage, and here you'll find a horribly warped meadow. If you take the time to look around, you'll find villagers wandering around, recalling events which happened a long time ago. In the lore, these creatures are actually clones, created from the originals living in the village. The clone villagers wander around and spout nonsense about thieves, and if you go to the swamp village, you'll eventually find a house with the word thief scrawled on the floor. But judging by the state of the village, this couldn't have happened recently. More evidence of the clone theory can also be found by observing the clones themselves. You'll notice that they repeat things over and over again, and if you're observant, you'll notice that the phrases they're copying are from the villagers in the silent forest. Inside the mushroom glade, you'll also find a house where the elephant child can be found, and amongst the stupidly large amount of poisonous mushrooms, we meet Mushroom Granny. I told you, I'm ready for anything. Nothing can surprise me at this point. Mushroom Granny seems to be, uh, growing mushrooms, and when we talk to her, we get the option to eat her. Yeah. If you decide to eat Mushroom Granny enough times, she'll eventually be killed. So, note to self, don't eat Mushroom Granny. Okay, this one actually surprised me. Granny is a clone as well, and we learn that she's the grandmother of the elephant child. But because she's a clone, the original presumably disappeared and died, and Granny doesn't realize that elephant child is actually her grandson. She's also the grandmother of the three, the traders we met earlier, so she's been about a bit. Showing her the drawing we obtained from the elephant's house, she'll perk up and she'll grant us access to the nearby room. Inside, we can talk to the child who will refuse to leave, and the only way we can get this child back is by forcefully grabbing him and dragging him home. When you choose the option to grab him, he'll start to recite the same rhyme we heard earlier, and if you listen closely, you'll notice a pattern. One little bear, two bears, four bears, and then five. This is linked to another small puzzle that you can solve to access a shed nearby the elephant's house. The code, 1245, can be used to open the door and steal an oxygen tank without having to rescue the child. The shed also contains components for the hunting rifle as well if you didn't get it from the wolf in chapter one so it's worth checking out. Whichever choice you decide to go with, you'll be rewarded with the oxygen tank, the last item we need to finish up chapter two. Before we attempt to burn the tree down, there's actually a second, slightly hidden way to complete chapter two. Remember the snail house from earlier? Well, now that the snail is gone, we can go inside the cottage. Coming back to this area, you'll notice that while the big snail is gone, all the little snails are still here, dead, implying that the larger snail crushed his friends or family to death in its escape. If you didn't already realize, there's never a happy ending in Darkwood. Inside the cottage, you'll find a wardrobe and a map, marking the location of a radio tower. You can also find a note written by a man slowly going insane, and he recalls the radio tower broadcasting an unusual signal. I don't think it's ever explicitly explained in game, but I assume that the man who wrote this code was the snail, before he, you know, turned into a mollusk. As I go to leave, this happens. The radio tower is one of the final key locations in the swamp, and getting there is a challenge in and of itself because it's really far away from the hideout. This whole area is filled with sleeping banshee babies, and if you're unlucky, you'll bump into the mother as well. Somehow I managed to avoid waking the babies and we navigate to a door locked with a code. We're never actually given this code, so you have no way of knowing what it is. But when you walk away, our character mysteriously recalls the code, meaning that we've probably been here before. Inside the shed, we find a note detailing a group of outsiders who stayed in the radio tower. If you explore the swamp, you can also find the location of a crashed helicopter as well, which I assume is how these people arrived here, taking refuge inside the radio tower and later, the hideouts that we've been visiting. Given that a lot of characters also refer to us as an outsider, and the fact that we already knew what the code to this door was, we can assume that we're part of the group that crashed here. The radio tower is a significant part of the game, and when you enter the door, you'll find a strange growth, which tells us that we've got one chance. 
If you smash through this fungus, you'll be thrust into the final optional dream sequence, which takes you through a weird hallucinations of tunnels and a twisted version of the doctor's house. In the dream, you'll need to solve a set of tricky puzzles while fending off black chompers. And if you die, the pathway to the end of chapter two will close off forever, meaning that you literally have one chance to complete it. I give it a go and die almost immediately. And now the door is locked until I restart the game and replay the whole thing up to this point. Looking at some of the comments on the wiki, there were quite a few people complaining about this sequence and the fact that you only got one chance, but I don't really mind this because it's an entirely optional set of events. The proper way to complete chapter 2 is to follow the cripple's advice, so if anything, this feels like a nice optional easter egg. After exploring the radio tower, I make my way home for our last night in the swamp before our escape. Arriving home, our character points out that someone has been here, and following these muddy footprints, you'll notice that someone has been rooting through our supplies. If you search your workbench after this occurs, you'll find a note from the wolfman, telling us that he's nicked our stuff, and if we want to get it back, we'll need to meet him at the sawmill in the north. This small interlude is a randomly timed event, which only occurs if the wolfman is alive from chapter 1. If the wolfman is already dead, this event will never occur and the sawmill will be forever empty. We arrive at the sawmill and the wolfman greets us on the radio offering us a challenge in return for our stolen items. If we agree, he tells us to leave our items with his assistant, who is actually just a corpse on the ground. A nice touch. Once you've emptied your inventory, you'll find a small backpack with a table leg and some health pills, and you'll be attacked by a pack of dogs. Halfway through the fight, the wolfman announces that he's found a violin, and he'll begin to play awful music to compliment you being beaten to death by dogs. Once the wolfman is defeated, he'll remain alive until you smack him twice with your table leg. And I love how the developers added the requirement to hit him twice, as if giving us the opportunity to exact revenge. Because we all know at this point, the wolfman is a prick. If you manage to survive the attack, you'll be able to nick the assault rifle, and I've been eyeing this up for the entire game. You also get your stolen items back, which is nice. Instead, if you die, the wolfman will run off forever, both with the items he stole and the items you brought to him. Now that we've uncovered most of the main locations in the swamp, it's time for us to end this once and for all. I make my way back to the village and with the oxygen tank equipped, we swim underneath the surface to the flooded basement. And as we do, we get one more final, final dream sequence. In the dream, we explore the basement underneath the talking tree. And this is another example of some wonderfully immersive scripted horror. In the basement, you'll notice the area starts to loop over and over again. Eventually, all of the crates start to burst open and you'll find strange corpses of unusually large animals littering the floor. Further into the tunnels, I encounter a blocked doorway, and if you try and break it down, you'll be interrupted by a villager who tells you to stay away. At this point, you have a choice. You can either continue to break down the barricade, causing the villager to turn into a black chomper, or you can follow this hallway until eventually the whole floor becomes consumed by corpses, and you'll eventually be killed. As far as I know, all of these outcomes end in death with no real changes between them. After the dream ends, you'll find a gas tank, which we can use to spill fuel all over the floor. Using a torch to set it alight will cause the flames to spread to the tree, consuming it entirely. After setting fire to the tree, the village will slowly become consumed by flames, and there's nothing else we can do for now. So I return home and wait for nightfall. This part is actually really cool, and you'll hear the sounds of screaming and wailing from the now burning tree, which I assume to be the poor souls who were trapped inside. And this is pretty morbid, in a good way. Back inside the hideout, once nighttime arrives, you'll get a unique one-time event, which depicts the entire swamp being consumed by fire, and all of the burning survivors will pour out of the forest and swarm you until either you die or daytime arrives.
Somehow I managed to survive this by using every single bullet that I had, but I don't think the outcome changes if you die either, unless you're playing on hardcore mode. Once morning arrives, we can go back to the village, and now the tree has been turned into a smoldering crisp, leaving a pathway for our escape. Yeah, this is a pathway. Don't ask me how long I spent wandering lost around this village. Couldn't you have at least drawn this as an open exit? The epilogue is the final section of the game, and it's pretty short, but there's two outcomes that you can achieve depending on your choices. We find ourselves on the road home, which I assume is the same road from the photo we've been desperately showing everyone, and here the music takes on a melancholic sombre tone. After walking the road for a while, you'll start to see corpses of people who didn't manage to make it out alive. And eventually, you'll also find the cripple, also trying to make his escape. And man, this part hit me hard. You can't do anything to help him, other than mercifully ending his life. And you won't get a reward for this. The game won't even acknowledge that he's there. You're simply forced to watch the poor man struggle, and if you watch long enough, he'll eventually give up and stop moving. If you manage to complete the radio tower dream sequence without dying and escape the forest without burning the tree, you'll find the cripple on the road who will thank you for sparing his life. This could be considered the good ending for the cripple, but also the bad ending for some other characters, so you'll never truly win. After a nice stroll through the forest, we encounter a town, and this location is different from the rest of the game due to its urban aesthetics. I feel like I'm playing an old, lost Silent Hill game, and the atmosphere is wonderful. Following the streets, you'll encounter normal looking people going about their daily lives, and we arrive at what I assume to be the protagonist's apartment building, and eventually you'll find your apartment on the second floor. We saw this apartment in one of our previous dreams, so we already know where everything is. In the merciful ending, you'll arrive home, take off your coat and greet your dog in the living room. This dog makes the same sounds as the ones in the forest, and no, I definitely didn't have a little wee when I heard its bark. We find a key in the cupboard, have some soup in the kitchen, unlock the bedroom door and then go to bed. Being able to see your character take off his coat and settle down for a well-deserved rest is a really nice ending to the game. You never usually get to see the aftermath of horror movies, and sometimes it just really adds that nice little touch. Before the credits roll, you'll get a small dialogue explaining the fates of the characters in the forest. We learn that Piotrick went to explore the Milky Way like he'd always dreamed of although we know that he eventually burned to death in the junkyard. At least that one wasn't our fault. The elephant family locked themselves away in their house for good, probably burning to death. It's also revealed here that the child who we rescued was trying to escape the house, and in response, the mother locked them all up for good. I feel kind of bad about this one because we did bring the child home, but on the other hand, they're the only ones still alive because they locked themselves away in the first place. We also learn that the musician, if not eaten by his own parents, managed to free the pretty lady with the key, but after doing so, she ate him alive. Nice. Pretty much no matter what choice you make, the musician will likely be killed horribly. But if you leave the chicken lady alive and kill the pretty lady, she will actually adopt the musician, which is cool. But hang on, there's actually two endings to the game, and the real ending you can achieve by following some specific steps in the epilogue. If you replay the story and instead deviate from going up the stairs to your apartment, you can actually go downstairs into the basement, and you can interact with this radio. Interacting with it multiple times, it'll tell you to go to sleep and the lights will turn off. Going back to our apartment building now, we can move the furniture in the living room to reveal some hidden roots under the floor. Remember way back at the start of the game when we entered the silent forest, we saw a corpse on the floor who referenced that in our last hideout, we should look underneath the floor. Well, this is what he's referring to. Pretty cryptic. In the kitchen, we can grab a screwdriver and pry up the floorboards to reveal a pulsating strange root substance. Following the substance in the bedroom, I look under the bed and reveal an unusual hole, and then the screen fades to black. This is the true, real ending of the game, and we awaken back in the forest again, completely naked with our clothes strewn around us, which implies that the protagonist actually became a sleeper, sharing a similar fate to the other villagers. Following the trail of roots, we eventually come across a strange white light, which we can talk to, and this strange entity reveals itself as the being, the source of the plague and the crazy happenings in the forest. If you look around, you'll also find the doctor on the floor completely mad, and I'm guessing we've ended up the same as him after all. When interacting with the creatures, you'll have the option to either remove your hand or keep it there, and if you don't forcefully resist the being, you'll end up with the merciful ending instead. But instead, if you continue onward, you'll find a man with a flamethrower, and here we can steal the flamethrower to end this once and for all.
In this ending, our character burns anything and everything, seemingly perishing in the fire himself. This time, the ending dialogue informs us that the majority of the villagers either escaped or perished in the fire, but this time we learn that the musician managed to hide and eventually get rescued. It's explained through optional lore that this being was the source of the plague, and all of the happenings in the forest including the creation of the talking tree. The being used the tree to create clones of various characters, which explains why the trader was carrying our key, and also explains some other oddities like the clones in the mushroom glade. With this mysterious being dead and the forest purged in fire, things can get back to normal, and that's the canon ending. So, I hope you enjoyed playing Darkwood with me. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like or a comment letting me know what you thought of Darkwood, and subscribe for more content like this in the future. As I mentioned in the beginning, I've set up a Patreon page for anyone who wants to support my content, and you can check the link in the description for more information. And as always, happy gaming!